Today on the show, we're talking Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2. Is there anything else you could say that's more interesting? Oh, I have a suggestion. How about, orange you glad to see me? <laughs> no. <laughs> so how did you think about it? How did I think about it? <sighs> this is your big movie. Uh, this, I mean, I don't know if it's my big movie, but it's, it's a big- It's your big movie. <laughs> it's, I, I'm not taking credit for this movie. This is the movie you've been waiting for. I mean, well, yeah, I've been excited about it. And it finally came out, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Ah, I like stuff. All you people on the internet say I don't like anything. They like, do? Yeah, do they, they do. they say that? They do say that. They go, oh, you don't like anything. You're a bitch. They say you that? You hate everything, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it's not true. Just who in the hell do you think you are? Well. <laughs> love about Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is that we really get to focus on these characters, developing them, their interpersonal relationships. Uh, I just, I love personally smaller stories and I also like it when the villain is kind of directly tied to the characters. For example, like I really like Ant-Man, you know, I like Ant-Man a lot and that was a very small personal story. What was it about? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 very much is centered around the theme of family. Specifically, uh, Peter Quill finding his family because he never knew who his real dad was. Uh, there's been a lot of debate on the internet of who it's gonna be because I, you know, we all thought they're not gonna do Jason of the Spartax and I'm glad that they didn't because I don't like his dad in What's the comics. Uh, the Spartax is, you know, like you have the Kree and you have like- That was in the comic book? Yeah. He would have a different dad? He has a different dad in the comics. Oh, so who was his dad? Uh, so we find out that his dad is Kurt Russell. <laughs> Uh, his dad's Ego the Living Planet, which was a huge surprise to me. I heard that Ego the Living Planet was gonna show up. I was really excited, but I did not expect to see him in this way. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was good. I liked it. I was into it. It was weird. It was super weird, which is what the Guardians is all about. I mean, the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, what I like about this specific franchise within the MCU is that it does very much embrace the weirdness, and I think a lot of that has to do with James Gunn, who is the director. He has directed a lot of weird movies, and he's a weird guy, so I think he's kinda... Did he make a weird movie about slugs? He did, it was called Slither. It's it's really weird if you wanna check it out. And Michael Rooker is actually in that too, so... Oh. Yeah. Love Michael Rooker. Slugs. Yeah. <laughs> Space slugs, I think, actually. So Peter meets his real dad. They go back to his planet, which is his dad. <laughs> And uh, things are not exactly what they seem. Uh, we find out that Peter is, his other half is that he's half celestial, half human. That's yeah. crazy. So he's like part God, essentially. Like yeah. cosmic God with a little G. Uh, and, There's you know. bigger gods? What? Are there bigger gods? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's levels of Godhood within the, within the Marvel. Universe. You have demigods. You've got little g gods. You got big g gods. What's Thor? Uh, he's like a he's you know he's like a demigod kind of. That's his deal. He's not like a like he's kind of a god, but you know. Anyway, keep going. Anyways, um, what's Vision? Well, hold on. <laughs> Just stop. Um, so uh, and you know things turn out not to be as they seem. His dad is not the cool dad that we were all hoping Peter Quill's dad would be and he ends up becoming the villain and they have to stop him and we find out that he has implanted these like little seeds of himself everywhere and that his big goal is to take over all of these planets and become all of these planets. Yes, at first I was very excited that Ego the Living Planet was a floating space brain for millions of years in outer space and he learned how to manifest his own physical material. Yeah. And he built a planet for himself and then he created the molecules into his own physical body. Well, yeah, Space Brain, I mean, you're a flying brain from space, you know? How did you feel about the portrayal of Ego, the living planet? Like, were you... Well, I was pretty stoked at first, but then I was kind of disappointed that he turned out to be the villain and by the end. Right. I'm a little confused and I'm not sure how to feel about that. Yeah, okay. I know how to feel about that. Oh, gosh. 
It's time we address the elephant in the room. Uh-huh. People are getting tired of Space Brain stealing my screen time. <laughs> so, okay. As a comments here, I'm going to read. No, no. Oh, God. Here we go. This one says, the brain is too nice and boring. Note he said boring. Don't listen to him, Space Brain. It's just the internet. You just gotta get used to it. Just like, don't worry about it. Dr. Smoketree says, no offense, but Space Brain sounds like a huge pussy. All right, let's just, let's chill on that a little bit. Nobody likes Space Brain. You know, there was a lot of mean comments about you too, and they actually still keep coming in, but. No, everybody always liked me. No. I was popular right from the get-go. No. Well, I mean, it's the internet. Some people like you, some people don't. Don't worry about it, Space Brain. Human beings are so cruel. They are, but at the same time, you know, you have to think of it like they're trying to toughen you up, you know? So just let them teach you that lesson. They're your teachers. You can't, you know, you have to love your trolls a little bit. I struggle to understand your species. You know, I do too, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> so now let's talk about the characters and their interpersonal relationships. First up, you have Star-Lord and you know, he feels like he's been deprived of this father figure. And, you know, I've been really wanting, like, Yondu and him to hash it out, you know, like ever since the first one. Because in the first one, at the end of it, like, Yondu knows that Star Lord tricks him and doesn't give him the Infinity Stone and, like, goes along with it. Like, he totally knows. But that's because he thinks of him as a surrogate son. And this comes up a lot in this movie specifically. Like, all the pirates band together and they're like, Captain, like, why do you keep letting him go? Like, why do you keep doing this? And it's like, well, duh, it's because he loves him and it's his son, but he just, like, can't say it because he's a gnarly space pirate. And, like, to be able and to admit that you love someone, like that doesn't go with your gnarly space pirate captain thing. But I think it's adorable within his crew, uh, like Kraglin, like you can tell that Kraglin thinks of himself as his son, you know, like he, and he's like, you know, they have this prodigal son thing going on. It's like, well, we're here with you. And like, why do you keep giving this guy a pass? So you have this whole prodigal son deal, which I totally enjoyed. Uh, I thought it was really great. And the whole mutiny that happened, it's like, in fact, Yondu, I think, had one of the best fucking stories in the movie. Like, I think Star-Lord and Ego, that was good stuff, but Yondu and Star-Lord was like, that was some real shit, you know? Cause like at the end, when like Yondu, you know, takes him and is flying away with him and saves him and sacrifices his own life. And he's like, you know, that guy may be your father, but I'm your daddy, you know? And I was just like, oh my God, like I loved it so much. And it was so sweet. And then in the end too, I mean, not only, does Yondu have to deal with the fact that he does think of Star-Lord as his son, like he was his father, and he finally, like, they come to, to embrace that about one another, finally. You also have him, like, the story of him having to be exiled from his pirate family. Like, the other Ravagers, you know, exiled him, and it's, like, hurt him. Like, it's hurt him. You see him when he's talking to Sylvester Stallone on that planet at that crazy awesome robot whorehouse that looked really cool. Uh, and he's just like, you could tell how hurt he was by being exiled. Like he wants to be back a part of his space pirate family. And in the end, when they see that he did the right thing and they accept him and they show him the colors, I thought that was really, really fantastic. And another thing I loved with Yondu was when he's talking to Rocket Raccoon. You know, cause Rocket has been an asshole. Like he is an asshole. Like he's constantly, he never has anything nice to say. He's always getting them in trouble. He steals the batteries, you know, he's just fucking being a dick all the time. And you know, Yondu, I loved it when Yondu's like, you're like this, you know, because, because I'm you. Like I see you because I am you, you know? And it's like, oh, I thought that was really great. And Rocket finally kind of had his moment, you know, to like deal with some real shit and like put the jokes aside and put being an asshole aside and put alienation aside and like confront the problems that he's having, you know? And Yes, I thought it was very great that all the characters seem to have their moments. Yes, absolutely. I mean, every single character, even though there were so many jokes in this, they all had their moment of realness and seriousness. So we have a lot of father and son relationship issues going on within this movie, but not only that, we also have some really great sister problems to deal with. 
Gamora and Nebula specifically, okay? In the first movie we meet them, we know they have beef, you know, we know there's a problem going on. And in fact, I wasn't really a huge fan of Nebula in the first one, but in the second movie, I think that she really shined. We learned so much more about her. Uh, the story where she's talking about how Thanos pitted these two girls against one another, and every time Gamora would win in a fight, he would replace some part of her body with some cybernetic and like essentially like torture her and like dismember her and like take her apart like piece by piece. And it was so fucked up. And I thought to myself too, I was like, really? Gamora wouldn't pick up on this and then just like let her sister win once before so like her sister wouldn't be tortured to death by the father. But the thing is, is Gamora was just trying to be as tough as she could be to survive herself. And I mean, Gamora herself can't even admit to Star-Lord that she has feelings for him. So I mean, she's not, She's not one to admit emotional feelings, you know? And Nebula just wanted a sister. Like that's, she just wanted to be loved, you know? And it was just like, oh, so powerful. It's so beautiful. Um, and I cannot wait to see more of Nebula. And I think that she is gonna be a major player within the Infinity War movies. In fact, she's a major player within the Infinity War itself. So, I mean, this is Nebula on the front cover. She has hair in the comics. Um, so she looks a little bit different, but yeah, I mean, she's got beef with Thanos in the comics as well as in the movies. A small thing that I really appreciated about Nebula was, so she's this very tortured character, okay? She's gone through a lot of physical pain in her past, okay? Like as a child, like she has just been tortured, right? So like she's dealt with a lot of pain and because she survived it, she can deal with it now. And so in the end of the movie, they need this generator situation and like, they're like getting ready, like they need some, some juice. And so she's like, you know what? Let me hook it up. I'll take a hit for the team. You know, I'll be the generator for this. You know, and the guy's like, this is gonna, really gonna hurt. And she's like, you promise, you know? And then he's like, all right. And like, she takes the pain and like, it's such a positive way to take that horrible thing. Like something horrible that's happened to her. She uses it in a positive way to help the team in the end. I also loved seeing Drax and Mantis uh, put together. I think those two characters were really funny. Uh, Mantis is adorable. Uh, let's just like put that out there. Like Mantis looked so cute. I loved her. She was this empathic being, you know, and she's been just essentially a pet for Ego. I mean, she herself has never had a family. You know, she was abandoned. She's just been essentially like a living Ambien for Ego, <laughs> which by the way, as somebody with insomnia, like I really wish that I had a mantis in my life. You know, I wish I had some homie that would just come and be like, sleep, you know, that would just be like the super best. But uh, I, I loved her when she's talking with Drax and Drax starts opening up with her about his family who has been killed. You know, his wife and daughter have been killed by Thanos and that's why he like wants to fucking kill Thanos because he had a family that he loved. And you know, and that pain of that, and when he was looking out over those pools, talking about his daughter, you know, and like Mantis puts her hand on him, starts crying. I was just like, oh, it was so good. And like, let's just talk about Batista for a minute as Drax. I mean, he's like so perfectly suited for this role. Like this is his role. It's so good. And James Gunn knows how to use him perfectly. I love that Drax doesn't understand the intricacies of, you know, communication between humans and like things are lost on him. And the same thing is with Mantis. Like she hasn't had any friends, so she doesn't know either, you know? So those two together were really cute. I loved it when he told her that she was ugly. <laughs> that was like really funny. Like, uh, and I, oh God. And the part where he's talking about his wife, where, you know, he's talking to Star-Lord. He's like, there are those who dance and those who do not, you know? And he knew his wife was the one for him when he was at some crazy dance and like she was not dancing and even the most melodic song in the universe, she would not even tap her foot to that shit, you know, and that's how he knew. And oh, I just thought that was just really adorable. Uh, I was really into that. He just, his line delivery, his comedic timing is really perfect. And then of course you have, you know, baby Groot who, <laughs> I mean, everybody loves Chibis. I mean, come on, he's a baby Groot, he's adorable. You know, and he's the baby of the Guardians of the Galaxy's family. Like the Guardians of the Galaxy, they all come from these fucked up families. So they've become their own family together. It's like dysfunctional and weird, but like they're making it work. And like within that family, they have a baby that they all have to take care of. And I love how he's always, baby Groot acts like a baby. He loves Gamora. He's always like waving at her, like in the sads when she goes, cause he doesn't want to see his mom go. And they're always whole, it was just adorable. And fuck that opening scene 
where Groot is dancing to Mr. Blue Sky by the Electric Light Orchestra was just like the best. It was just that opening scene in general was just the best because one thing that I feel has been really missing from a lot of these movies is being able to see a team just dispatch some problem, you know? It's like, just fight a fucking monster. And I loved the way they shot it, where it's really focused on baby Groot and you see them kind of in bits and pieces of the fight behind him. I thought that was just so well done. And as someone who is a huge fan of Jeff Lynne and the Electric Light Orchestra and specifically Mr. Blue Sky, like I've danced to Mr. Blue Sky. I don't think you cannot dance to Mr. Blue Sky when it's on. And that monster spewing out rainbow stuff, that was that's awesome. It's just like so much fun. So now we get to meet the Sovereign, which are led by this high priestess Aisha and these, these gold people. And they're all like these, these perfect people. And that's Aisha's things in the comic book. She's kind of a villainess or becomes a villainess because she wants to perfect, you know, the universe. And she thinks that like, perfection is not a great thing. Like it sounds cool, but it's not. It's like really stifling and there's no, it's just complete order. There's no room for chaos in her in her world. Like there's no room for it. Why are they gold? Uh, because I guess they're perfect and I don't know, everybody loves gold. I don't know, they looked fucking awesome though. That makeup looked really good. And like, she looked amazing. And I kind of, I wish that she did hook up with Star-Lord and I got to see a little bit of that, but whatever, I'm a perv, it's fine. It's a hot gold lady. I'd like to dress up like her. But uh, I enjoyed seeing the Sovereign and like, especially their, their weird little pods where that's just like a video game thing. The thing about the Sovereign is, is that they're all like created perfectly in some test tube to be this specific person with these specific talents. And then when they're born in that society, they grow up and they do exactly what they have been genetically programmed to do. So, I mean, oh. yeah, it's a little creepy, you know, it's not really the best, you know, but they're their own thing, it's fine. But the best thing that's gonna come out of the Sovereign is uh, in the end credits, you know, you see Aisha and she's sitting there and she's like, I am making the next step in evolution, like the truly perfect being that's gonna take us to the next fucking deal. And it's totally gonna be Adam Warlock. It's totally gonna be Adam Warlock. And I'm just so fucking stoked. I'm super excited. Uh, and it makes total sense for her to be creating Adam Warlock because in the comics, she's kind of an offshoot of him, but that's like a hole in the bag of cats. We're not gonna get into it. It's Who's very that? convoluted. Who is it? But Who's Warlock? Adam Warlock is essentially Marvel's like cosmic space Jesus. Uh, space Jesus? Space Jesus, yeah. He's super weird. I totally love Adam Warlock. I'm a fucking big fan of him. In the comics, Adam Warlock, who plays a huge part in the Infinity War, and that's another reason why I was wondering if he was ever gonna come into it, because they've been fucking teasing us with his ass for years now, okay? But he has an Infinity Stone in his little head. He's got the Soul Gem in there. So I wonder if when he pops out, if he's gonna be the one that has like the last Infinity Stone, because the Soul Gem has not been introduced yet. That's the one stone that hasn't shown up yet. So maybe we'll see him in Thor Ragnarok this year. You know, maybe he'll pop out then. I don't know, you know, but I'm fucking so excited for Adam Warlock. He's the best. What does so. he do? What's his powers? Um, does he have superpowers? Yeah, he's got a lot of powers. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to quantify. It's kind of hard to quantify how many powers he has, especially if if he does have the Soul Gem in the movies, then he's gonna be like super powerful. And there was a big part of me that I had given up on seeing Adam Warlock because we were teased, we saw his cocoon in the collector's deal, but then later on, when they create Vision, Vision has one of the gems in his head and Vision is very similar to Adam, he's very Adam Warlockian where he's kind of this more perfect higher evolved being who like is very Jesus-y. I mean like Vision is very much about life, you know, like that's what he's like here for and he's not angry and he's like a, you know, very loving, he's a very loving super being. And so I thought we weren't gonna get Adam, but I guess we are and I'm fucking stoked. I'm super stoked, I couldn't be more stoked. Also, quick shout out to the Watchers. Uh, Stan Lee was on the moon with these big headed tall dudes. What were those? Yeah, they're the Watchers. What do they do? Well, they're like the universe's historians. Like they just kind of watch everything and they're not allowed to interfere. They just watch and they record everything, you know? And they like kind of, you know, the historians of the universe. Earth has a Watcher, his name's Owatu. You can learn more about him in Epic History X-Men Volume 2. Talk about him a little bit. I'm also interested to see whether Kraglin is gonna be a part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, whether he's gonna kind of remain as like a, 
like a sea stringer or something on the team. Uh, Kraglin is the space pirate that was like the other surrogate son of Yondu. And then you see him in the end and he has the fin on his head and he's trying to do the, the arrow thing, which I think the fin in this one looked way better. I liked like the mohawk thing way better this time around. Uh, fun fact, the actor who plays Kraglin is James Gunn's brother. And I was reading on IMDb that he's the onset rocket raccoon. So I guess like- What does that mean? Well, what I guess, does that mean? Well, I guess when they're on set, he is, plays rocket when Bradley Cooper, because Brad, they're not gonna have Bradley Cooper on set. They can't afford to have his ass on set every day, okay? They can afford to have him come in and do some lines, but he's not gonna be showing up for that. So James Gunn's brother though, I mean, that's his bro. So his brother's like, yeah, I'll fucking be on set and do that shit. Soul Stone. What's the Soul Stone? Uh, What's the Soul Stone do? Okay, well, the Soul Stone, in, in the comics it's green, but I think in the movies it's gonna be orange, which also makes me think that it is gonna be an Adam Warlock's head because they're all gold, you know, and Adam Warlock is gold. So the Soul Stone is like, it can like, it kind of has some vampirish qualities where it can take people's souls and like bring it into itself and it has a pocket dimension within itself, which is kind of like this utopian heaven type situation. It's really weird. Like aesthetically speaking, the design work and all of the makeup and the costumes and everything, the colors, I love it. It's really top notch stuff. So well done. I, I love those robotic whores. Those look so good. Like I was just, I just love the world building that's going on, all the neons. I mean, yeah, they've really, they're really killing it over there with all that. So all you artists and artisans and builders and everything, like you guys are just doing such a great job. Another thing I really liked about this movie is that I felt like it had a really great balance between action and story. Like, like I just recently saw Fate of the Furious, you know? And that was just like, once it got started, like that movie just did not stop. Like it was just like, I got action fatigue. You know, I was just like, by the end I was like, I don't care. Can we just take a break for a second? Like I'm tired. No. Fuck. That's not real. Yeah, no, I liked that in this movie, I felt like they had a lot of really great action sequences, but they were balanced out by these smaller, more chill sequences. Like when Mantis and Drax are just sitting there looking over a pond and talking about life, you know? It's like, I need those moments, you know? I need that balance. Uh, and I also just, I love how colorful this film is. I love how much fun it is. I love that there's tons of jokes. I like that it's really weird. I like that it doesn't take itself too seriously. And I also like that we really talked about these characters, like I said, and their interpersonal relationships. It just really does it for me. Uh, I think another reason why I like this movie so much is because I was recently at Ikea and I was walking around and there was this kid and he was like in the middle of the aisle and he found this giant bundle of sticks that were like seven feet tall or something. And he like hoisted it up and was just like screamed with joy. I am Groot. <laughs> like he was just like so fucking pumped. Like, and I just like, it was so much pure joy that I, it stopped me in my tracks. And I just had to laugh. Like I laughed out loud. Like this kid was so juiced for this movie. And it made me like really juiced for this movie. Like this kid infected me with excitement for this movie because it's like in a way, like when I was a kid, you know, I saw the X-Men cartoon, right? And that just like, oh, like the fuck. Like when I heard that song, you know, it was just like, I was so fucking pumped, you know? And that's what got me into the comic books is like through the cartoon show. As an adult, seeing a child like get this excited, like as excited as I was, like that just, I don't know, it totally made me excited. So maybe you have some mom jeans kicking in. I don't know, but I just loved seeing this kid. And I know that there's other kids all around the world who like this will be their gateway. Like they'll see these movies. It's like, this is their X-Men cartoon show. You know, these movies. And that's pretty fucking awesome. You're pregnant? No. <laughs> Here we are, 2017. We've had a lot of Marvel movies at this point, a lot. Some of them have been better than others, uh, but I think the direction in which the MCU is going is really exciting. They've constantly been building, you know, step by step by step. I really appreciate like all of the, the groundwork that they've laid over the past few years. I think it's really paying off for them. This year in particular, I feel like 
is a really great year for me because obviously I really like Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I'm really, who isn't looking forward to Spider-Man Homecoming? I mean, come on, like it's, like, it's like after Sony's dropped the ball like so many times, it's just like, it'll be nice to have a good Spider-Man movie. And then also, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to Thor Ragnarok. You know, I love like where that's headed. And I love that Thor has really struggled as a series. Like I don't own any of the Thor movies on Blu-ray. I don't want one or two. They've been, I think some of the weakest entries within the MCU because Asgard's just really fucking hard to do. And it's, it is a little weird, but now that Guardians of the Galaxy has broached that weirdness and embraced it and audiences have embraced that weirdness as well, they have the confidence to make Asgard a little more weird, a little more cosmic. I think we're gonna see a lot more cosmic weird Guardians bullshit in this movie, in the new Thor movie. And I think that's the perfect direction to go in. And I'm super stoked. Also, Jeff Goldblum is gonna be in the MCU, so. <laughs> So this has been a cute little video. <laughs> I guess. Um. <laughs> Just a casual movie review. Well, yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was kind of a perfect, fun, balanced, popcorn, Marvel summer movie. Really worked for me and my sensibilities. It's what you needed right now. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I'd like some levity in my life. I could use some laughs, you know? Laughs. Yeah. I like humor in comic book movies. I like color in comic book movies. So it had a lot of those things. I like family, you know, like all these things. So they kind of had, had what I was looking for. You know what I mean? I mean, I've got a weird family. I mean, I've got a robot and a space brain <laughs> and little beans. So, you know, I can relate. And it'll be an even better family once we get rid of that boring space brain that nobody likes. Actually, the law of probability states that there's gotta be someone out there that probably likes me. <laughs> thank you guys for watching. And I wanna also thank everyone who bought a Dune box. Uh, Dune Club is coming this July. It'll be on Twitch. I'm so really excited about that. Like, it was like you can't even, you don't even know. So uh, yeah, and if you like this video, be sure to thumbs it up, subscribe to my channel. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, leave some comments. How did you feel? Did you like this movie more than the first one or the second one? You know, what do you think? Who's your favorite character? Did you think Mantis was ugly? <laughs> the movies I feel like are the weakest for me personally are the ones where we're stuck dealing with the Infinity Stones and trying to set up this larger event in the future. And it kind of, it kind of bogs down what you can do with the story because it's not about the characters anymore. It's about setting up a movie in the future, which I would much rather just get to know these characters and like be friends with them. And... Are you saying that you don't like giant world ending events as much as smaller stories? Uh, well, in my last video, about you know Marvel comics in decline, I, I did state that like in the comic books, I'm not a huge fan of the big events that happen. You know, like I mean, in the past, they were cool because they didn't happen all the time. But I feel like now they happen so often that they've lost their meaning. They're not as meaningful. They're not as impactful. Does that mean that you're not looking forward to the Infinity War? To be honest, I'm I'm really afraid of the the Infinity War movie that's coming. What? Why? It's gonna well, be awesome. Well, I'm not a huge fan of like these larger events in the comic books themselves. Like I always feel like they get in the way of the story that I really care about, which is like the characters and like what they're doing and their interpersonal relationships. And you know, you know they're gonna save, you know, you know they're gonna save the world, you know, it's like, who cares? Like whatever. And so, you know, I'm not looking forward necessarily to Thanos in this either. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> about what? Movies about family are boring. <laughs> I want explosions! You know, Action! Uh, no. Muscles! Uh-uh. I disagree with that. I'll d I disagree with that because I feel like stories about families are more personal to all of us because we all come from families and as we know a lot of our families are not perfect and we all have had uh, difficulties with our family members, you know, in different ways. So I feel like this is, I don't know, it's, it's reaching a larger audience whereas I don't you know, I've never saved the world, you know? I've never stopped, you know, a comet that's gonna hit Earth. But I have had to deal with problems with my family. And so 
I feel like that's, you know, hits hits home for me. I like that. You never saved the Earth? No, not yet. 